Hurst. I'm a lecturer, uh, senior lecturer actually now, um, in um, International Relations Theory and Methods uh, in the Department of War Studies uh, here at King's. Um, I joined King's in 2017, um, so fairly recently, um, but long enough in the tooth, I think, to hopefully have some useful reflections today. Uh, my own research is, situated, is situated in uh, international relations theory primarily, so I often joke that I kind of uh, confuse people for a living. Um, but my empirical research sits um, in kind of critical military studies, um, specifically looking at the US military um, and their use of games, simulations, uh, and other digital uh, media um, for teaching and training purposes. Um, so over the last few years, I've uh, found myself in the, the somewhat surprising situation of hanging out on military bases and interviewing the, the goods and the greats of the US military gaming establishment, uh, not somewhere I ever expected to end up, um, but it's been absolutely fascinating um, to, to have, have been there. Um, and just a, a really a big thank you to everybody for coming along. It's, it's wonderful to have been invited and great to see so many faces uh, here to talk about uh, women uh, in war and international politics. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to, to field some questions and say something uh, remotely useful. So thanks for having me. Um, okay, I'll jump in. Thank you so much. Um, echoing what Aggie said, thanks for, for having me. And it's so nice to be a part of this. It's really wonderful to meet everyone. So uh, my name is Kieran. I joined uh, King's in, well, this September, peak pandemic, um, as a lecturer in international relations. And my research, uh, it focuses on the area of global politics and technology. So what I do is um, some critical IR. I look mostly at public opinion. Um, I consider it uh, in many different ways, but um, mostly at how public opinion and polling um, manifest uh, through the act of inquiry, social inquiry as uh, forms of power and control, I'm looking at the history of the polling industry and how it's developed and, and been exported worldwide. And um, I teach on some master's modules um, here, and I, I've so far loved my time at King's, but I really look forward to actually meeting people in person because so far that hasn't happened. But thank you all. Hi everyone, I'm Savni, and um, I am a lecturer at the Defence Studies Department of King's College London. Um, so like Kiran, I started lecturing in September, but I've been at King's for a very long time. Um, since 2013, I think, where I joined as a master's student and just basically never left. Um, so, um, yeah, first of all, thank you, Sarah, for this. We were doing some wonderful work and um, I'm really happy to be here and, and meet people um, and be here with Agit Kiran. Um, so my research looks at civil military relations in India and I look at how the civilians and the military interact and make decisions during wars. Um, my research is mainly historical so far. It's, it's looked at uh, independent India and how civilian leaders and military leaders interacted, but I'm quite interested in people during wars and, and how they make choices, um, what imperatives are acting upon them that, that makes them do things they do. So this is where I'm at, but I'm really, really looking forward to sort of broadening it into broader South Asian security studies, diplomatic history, military history, and so on. So hopefully um, it should be fun and I can answer some of your questions. Thank you. Uh, we are so happy that you could join us tonight. Thank you again for doing so. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Kristen, who is going to put some questions to you. And I am very, very excited to hear your answers. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to our three panelists again for coming tonight. This is, as many of you know, the second installment in the series, so it's really cool to have everyone back. You can see that we've got some participants who've been here before as well. So without further ado, I'm just going to kick off with the first question. So I think um, just by order of answering, we can stick to the order that we already have now to structure things a little bit. Um, but for the first question, could you talk to us a little about your career paths and how you got where you are today and you can start with sort of what led to your choice of making a career in this field and did you have any influential role models or ex like relevant experiences that helped you to learn important lessons along the way you can share highlights from your career and is there anything you wish you had done differently which is always interesting so if i could kick off with uh, aggie do you want to start again Sure. Th thanks, Kristen. Um, do you want me to answer all of those um, before the others speak, or should we take one of those, each of those questions in turn? I feel like I'll just be monologuing for. Um, <laughs> yes, no, I might 
Well, you can sort of choose which elements that uh, you want to include, but if you sort of want to take us through uh, your career paths and the, the drivers and decisions that sort of put you, put you through your career as it's been so far and if there have been any major highlights or bumps in the road that we should all look out for that you would want to share, that'd be great. <laughs> Certainly, thanks. I mean, it's been a really interesting process to, to think about these questions and put together some answers. Um, there's always the danger that, you know, you start with, you know, I was, I was three years old when I had my first, you know, political epiphany. And obviously, you know, I, won't, I won't bore you with the details of all of that stuff. Um, what I wanted to start by saying, actually, was that um, I don't think you always have, ha have to have been um, someone who thinks of yourself as a sort of scholarly or academic person to get into academia. Um, I was certainly not uh, especially engaged in school and I certainly didn't leave school with a clear sense of what I was going to do. So the first thing I would say is that if you don't have a solid career trajectory, that's actually absolutely fine. Um, these things, you know, even the best laid plans oftentimes don't map out as, as one expects anyway. Um, what I did was um, went to Manchester University to study politics and modern history and actually that was really the first kind of accident that led me to this point. Um, I was going to study history and I went along to the politics and modern history talk with a school friend of mine and suddenly thought that's that's for me. So had I not gone on that particular day, you know, everything could have been very, very different. What I found when I got to Manchester was that um, for the first time, really, uh, rather than getting kind of red lines through my work and people saying you mustn't say that, uh, was actually people kind of encouraging the, the critical and, and sort of reflexive um, and sometimes um, unconventional things that I wanted to talk about, the questions I wanted to ask, the subject matter I wanted to explore. Um, and I think really the, the simplest answer as to how I got into this was that I, I just never ran out of questions. Um, I kept um, feeling kind of confused by and uh, awkward in some ways in, in the social and political world and that was fuel enough to, um, to build a career, really. Um, I think academia, for all its faults, which I'm sure we'll get into, um, does furnish uh, the opportunity to, to explore you know, the ideas that you have, the critiques that you want to make of, of the social and political fabric um, in a way that, which really is rare. Um, I can't think of many other career paths that, um, that, that furnish um, that. Um, I don't know if, if Safani or Kieran want to come in on that before we move to the next point, um, or I don't want to <laughs> over, overstep the, the chair's um, <laughs> directions either. I'll just keep going, shall I? Is that more simple? Okay. So I think um, one of the things I wanted to say about, um, about role models and about experiences was certainly early on in, in the PhD process and as an early career scholar, um, I would say that, that mentors are extremely important, your, your PhD supervisors, the, the senior colleagues that they can introduce you to and all of that. Um, but I would say almost more important is the kind of peer group and the network that you can build up. Um, and really that's where I take my um, energy, my, my entitlement uh, and my um, kind of support structure um, from really that that's what keeps you going. So I think in terms of as you become established as an academic and as you build these these networks, um, whilst your own department can be extremely important, it's also uh, most often the case that your closest collaborators and sympathizers are not, are not going to be in your institution. So really, I think to ground yourself and to find your feet as an academic, it's really about that, that peer support network. Um, I moved back to London in 20 12, uh, having been up north for, for, for a decade doing all my, my PhD uh, work and, and undergrad work uh, and master's work and, and really in, in the five years after that it was building friendships with different colleagues at, at SOAS and UCL and Kings and City and uh, all sorts of other places so I think I think that's really um, really key for me. I would also say that um, when one of the things that I think we often hear, especially when we talk about gender and, and women in, in uh, academia, is this idea of imposter syndrome. And I, I've been reading a bit around this subject recently because I think it's both extremely important, but also actually rather problematic. So one of the things that I think um, is worth bearing in mind is that, of course, you know, imposter syndrome is a real thing and it is gendered and it affects people in a whole host of different ways. Um, but there are also real power structures in place which discipline people and, and limit people's capacities to succeed in a way which is not reducible simply to imposter syndrome. So sometimes when people are feeling that, it's not just because they have an individualized reaction, but actually because they are on the sharp end uh, sometimes of rather subtle and, and oftentimes not uh, immediately visible forms of, of power relations. Um, so I think what I'll, what I'll point to um, just to, to end on, um, thinking about what I would have done differently and if I could talk to myself 10 years ago when I was finishing my PhD and, and beginning my academic career is realizing the limits of what can be surmounted through sheer force of will 
Uh, I like to think of myself as quite a gregarious person, quite an energetic person, um, but it is also the case that gendered and, and racialized and, and other forms of, uh, of power relations do impact on you, even if you're in a friendly department, even if you're in a supportive institution. Um, and that can manifest in all sorts of different ways. You know, we know that, that female colleagues have oftentimes you know, different kinds of admin roles expected of them. We know they do more pastoral care. We know that they're oftentimes, um, you know, uh, put in positions where, especially when they're junior, they're not quite clear what a reasonable workload looks like. And, and you know, um, and I think um, making sure that you are communicating with your peers, with senior colleagues, just to get a sense of, of what is reasonable, what isn't, how to, to say no to requests, um, which again can be quite gendered. It's oftentimes difficult to say, this is beyond what I think is reasonable for me to be doing at lecture grade, given my existing workload and, and all of those sorts of things. Um, you know, I think I think War Studies has made some really good uh, progress in recent years around uh, hiring and promoting women. We've had several of our uh, female colleagues uh, rise to the rank of, of sort of professor over the last few years since I've been uh, here at here at King's. Um, but there is still a lot of work to do. I think one of the big areas is still uh, questions surrounding um, colleagues of colour. We do have a, a serious underrepresentation um, of, of women of colour and colleagues of colour in general, uh, both in War Studies and the institution. So um, I think that's something that, that we need to keep talking about. We need to keep um, building in everything from job application, wording uh, through to um, representation in terms of who's teaching what modules and, and which kind of research is, is positioned as central, what kinds of issues are positioned as central. Um, I think I'll, I'll shut up there and then we can explore more of those topics later on. Um, thanks very much. Thank you, Aggie. We can move on to, uh, to Kieran, but just uh... Just to sum up and say that it, it really is good to know that there are limitations on what you can achieve through sheer force of will. I think many of us in the COVID era graduate generation can, uh, can testify to that. Yeah, ab absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I think, um, I don't think I know really anyone who has a sort of linear career path where everything went perfectly and according to plan. And um, for me, it certainly didn't. Uh, I kind of, like many people, I came to this field of IR and academia in a very roundabout way. Um, for me, I, when I was young, um, I knew I was, I was really into school <laughs> and I knew that I wanted to do a PhD and I knew that I wanted to study history and, and politics and I was, um, my heart was set on it. But um, I am also I was a first generation Canadian and um, a child of uh, immigrant parents who um, we come from a culture that has a lot of conservative elements to it, uh, which meant that my life wasn't going to be really my choice. So I couldn't choose my education. I couldn't choose my career. I couldn't choose who I married or what hobbies or the things that I wanted to do. So everything was very predictated and it was a difficult thing to um, navigate and um, so I had no choice in the matter and my parents um, made me go to business school which they're lovely people but it's a cultural thing and uh, I know a lot of people have experiences like this where you you kind of you know status and, and community matter and you need to you know be a doctor engineer lawyer what those those sort of things that reflect well <laughs> and academia wasn't one of those things so i had to go to business school and i um hated it and i essentially failed <laughs> more or less i just scraped by but it really tore me apart to to do so poorly in something and then not know what to do after that and i finished um but i didn't know what to do and through my 20s my my main goal was really to get to actually here to this point now but i didn't know how to do that and i didn't have much guidance around that N no real mentors i wasn't i wasn't really in the field i wasn't versed in in um, politics and ir at all i hadn't studied it um so i decided to go the route of working and trying to find a job in research because i figured that if i tried to take up a research career i could maybe make my way into um, policy government and eventually do a phd um, and i worked a few corporate jobs and uh, they were soul sucking <laughs> to say the least definitely not where my heart was and and um, sometimes very hard they can be tough environments especially for women and young women um, and eventually I decided to apply for a, a master's. I applied to 
like maybe 12 or 13 different programs to do a master's in political science, didn't get into a single one, applied again, managed to get into one, did it. And like that was enough of an inspiration for me to keep going um, and eventually left Toronto, came here, did a PhD. Um, and uh, speaking of imposter syndrome and, and those sort of structures that make you, that kind of suck the confidence from you, um, those were already there when I started the PhD and I, I started in a program, I, I didn't feel like I even had an undergrad understanding of the field when I began. So even by the time I finished my PhD, and even now sometimes, I think, do I even know <laughs> anything? So I think the lack of confidence is very real and it sticks with you and it's hard to get rid of. But um, the PhD was incredible, some high highs, some lows, as, as always, I think. Um, and then now I feel quite lucky to be doing something that I enjoy and I care about. And I think for the first time ever, I feel set, set it like I'm doing what I want to do. And it's such a scary feeling in a way because I, I hadn't experienced that before. And you think, what if I lose this? You know what? <laughs> it's, it's a weird journey, but um, it's, it's great. And I can say that um, this inspiration that I've taken from learning in this field hasn't been lost on my family because my dad, after uh, over 40 years of uh, an IT career and retiring, he just went back to school to do an undergrad in political science and IR. He's in his second year and he's very stressed, <laughs> lots of deadlines, but he can, he sees now like what it means to, you know, do what you want to do. And so I'm all very happy, but yeah, that's the career route. So um, I think though the question, you know, is there wish, do you wish you had done anything differently? I know I can't have changed things. Um, I can't have changed my prior degrees. They, they are what they are. But I did learn a lot along the way. One thing I wish I could have changed is that um, the, the corporate environment really can silence you. And I think I wish I had stood up more to some of the, um, to, to sort of the culture of misogyny that was there. Uh, you. I, I was never adequately able to do it. I felt quite small. And so now I realized that there was no need for that. No need at all. And yeah, I, if I could do anything differently, it would have been to try and have a voice then. But you learn as you go. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. I think that's a uniquely sort of uphill story compared to many that we, that we hear often. So thank you for sharing that. It's really inspiring. Thank you. So uh, just uh, there have been a couple of questions in the chat. We'll get to those after we've sort of done with the, with the pre-moderated questions. So Sami. Thanks. I mean, I feel like imposter syndrome is, is a running theme because this afternoon um, I looked at the question, Sarah, you sent and I just thought to myself, why am I, how, how am I ever going to talk about any of this? I mean, um, and I, I had to have a sit down and actually really think through everything. And so thank you for that, um, because it, it really, that was the boost of confidence I think we needed um, to, to really think of our lives in a, in a sort of um, complete way or some sort of tangible way. Um, in terms of what led to your choice of career in this field, um, to be honest, um, I grew up around women who did not follow the norm. Um, you know, I had my grandmothers, my mother, my aunts and all of them. And it was, I never actually thought about it because they were all very, very determined to take the norm, turn it on its head and do what they wanted anyway. Um, so it, it never really occurred to me that, um, you know, out, that outside your home, there are expectations and there are rules you follow and there are conventions um, you follow so so I would say in terms of sort of my earliest um, role models that's just how I grew up and but in terms of coming to this career I actually wanted to become a filmmaker um, did not want I mean I loved school I, I loved school and I loved social science and I loved history but um, I really really wanted to be a filmmaker and then at one point I think and I had my plan of uh, my family's in India, I grew up in India, so it was all about, you know, I, I know what college I'm going to in India and, and that's it. And then by stroke of luck, and it really makes you think about how things fall in place and, and how 
no journey is linear or expected or you can't plan for it. Um, complete stroke of luck, I, um, I was in hospital for something and I saw this politics course at the University of Cambridge that I really was fascinated by and I thought, okay, great, let me just apply for it because why not? Um, fast forward about six months, I actually was at university in the UK um, at a really old college that I had no plans of going to um, and completely in over my head. Um, you know, as an international student says, there's, there's a massive cultural difference in, you know, at 18 sort of traveling halfway across the world. Um, no one in my family had traveled abroad to study um, and, and everyone was back home. So there were lots of things that were happening to me that I didn't know how to communicate or, or I didn't have the sort of tools to really process. Um, and, but then, um, and I, I loved politics. And then I remember in my second or third year, uh, Mira Sabratnam, who is now in SOAS, I think it was one of her earliest sort of teaching gigs, and Devin Curtis showed us um, a few films as part of the conflict and peace building module they were teaching us. And it was about Rwanda, it was about Israel and Palestine, it was about um, the drug trade. And I remember sitting there thinking, actually, I, I don't want to do anything else. I, I really want to learn more about this. And I just have so many questions and I just had a lot of questions. Um, so ended up at King's uh, after graduating. And that was, that was actually a turning point where I thought, well, these things fascinate me. And there are people who have made a career out of studying it. Um, because especially as a girl, you, you sort of do IR, you do politics. You don't, you don't grow up thinking I'm going to study wars, like never. Um, and, and I met these people at King's. Um, and then I think, and it's interesting because I went sort of went back and worked in Delhi for a bit um, in, in New Delhi at, at a think tank. And I always knew I wanted to do a PhD because again, I just wanted to know more about things. Um, and it seemed like a fascinating thing to do. And everyone at King seemed to love what they were doing. Um, and so I was doing a research assistantship there and I liked my work, but I really did not um, do well there. Um, it was a bigger culture shock than moving to the UK. I had a terribly hard time. Um, and at that point I felt like, okay, well, but I've committed to this because, you know, I've, I've done something that's not a normal sort of um, laid out profession where if you're a doctor or a lawyer, you know what to do. There are next steps, there are milestones. Um, I remember going to my parents with revision cards about, well, this is, what, this is what I want to do for my MA program and this is why I want to do it, but I'm not sure what career there is after this because I just like studying it. Um, and so I remember working at a think tank and thinking, well, this is what I've chosen. I can't, I can't give this up. Um, and, and I think that goes to, speaks to a lot of pressure we feel as women, um, extra pressure, structural pressures, where if we've started to prove ourselves, we can't really say, I give up because you're not sure you're going to get a second chance. Um, and at that point, again, as another sort of happy accident of my life, um, someone told me about the scholarship for a PhD at King's, not in my plan, um, had about a week to apply did it anyway um, and, and came to King's and, and that's what it, it has been ever since. So um, it's, I think, so in terms of just the journey, I would just say it's never been what I've expected. Um, I still can't believe, I, so I officially got my PhD two months ago. Um, I had completely written this year out. I said, okay, this is one year, you're graduating in the middle of a pandemic, nothing's going to happen. Um, but I got a job a few months after my viva in another completely unexpected turn of events. So I think one of the things that I would say a constant theme in my life is you can never plan for anything and, and, and opportunities actually don't really present themselves as sort of neatly tied up packages with bows. I mean, this PhD, if I think back to the way it was presented to me, it was very much, I don't like where I am. And this is a distraction and it's a trial run and it's a practice to do something that's not what I'm doing right now. Um, and, and it really just, and I didn't, to be honest, I didn't recognize it as the opportunity it was. Um, 
and and that's what I'd say. And in terms of um, highlights, so when I looked at the question about the highlights of my career so far, uh, and I was really thinking what really matters, and and it really struck me that when I was 18, and I came to the UK, this entire institution was incredibly intimidating. It was incredibly daunting to be there. Um, I had a completely different historical context of the world. Um, things like lectures, I didn't understand the accent of lecturers. So it was, it was so daunting that now if I think about it, for another 18 year old international student who thinks it's as intimidating and as daunting, the fact that I'm here on the inside saying, well, actually, you know, I'm, I'm in it now. It's, it's not as scary as it seems and it's not an insurmountable system, uh, which academia sometimes can be very, um, very, very impersonable. It's, it's quite cold, it's quite rigid. And, and I think thinking about the fact that I'm here, I'm right now I'm here and I can tell an 18 year old, actually, you can do it. And, you know, you, you can be an insider, um, you know, in some way is, is I would say the, the highlight. Um, and, and in terms of anything I wish I'd done differently, I think, I think not, but oh, I don't think so. I mean, I, I struggled with this question because I can't even sort of imagine a, a different way I could get here, um, except I would say, I would say at every point, say to myself, you deserve to be here and you're here for a reason, but it's okay to give up. It's, it's fine, it's not the end of the world. Um, and I think it goes back to what Aggie said about limited capability. It's, you know, we, we all put in thousand percent in what we do. Um, and, and I think sometimes telling ourselves we deserve to be here and, you know, we, we're great is what I would keep telling myself. But yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that uh, great recap, Savani. That's it's really interesting how all of you emphasize sort of curiosity as the fuel that kind of drove your decisions, and how everyone is also talking about ending up at King's, which is a life trajectory I endorse. <laughs> Only having an MA from the from the Department of War Studies, but it does feel like home indeed. So speaking about King's as sort of the institution, we've. Uh, we're just going to round off uh, the sort of moderated questions round with a little institutional King's question, which is, we would really like your perspective on how the prominence of women professors in the Department of War Studies or like more broadly in this, this field has changed in the past sort of five years-ish um, and what you predict is going to happen in the next sort of five to ten years. That'd be really interesting. Thanks, I'll, I'll jump in, uh, assuming it's my, my go again. Um, so I think there are some good reasons to be uh, optimistic and, and to celebrate success. Um, and there are some um, still pretty big hills that need to be climbed. Um, on the former side, um, as I said earlier, we've had several um, professors uh, recently um, uh, ratified in our department, brilliant uh, academics, people like um, Claudia Aradow and, and Rachel Kerr, uh, folks who have been at King's oftentimes quite a long time. Um, and um, are, get, are getting recognised for, for this excellent work that they've been doing and that's, that's really brilliant to see. Um, one of the issues we still have, I think, has to do with a kind of really uh, uneven um, kind of career trajectory pace. So we still do see um, promotions, uh, applications for promotions being put in earlier by male colleagues and oftentimes it taking uh, women longer to, to climb the um, career ladder. Um, and that can, can be for all sorts of reasons surrounding um, having families and the ways in which publications are very central to the career um, trajectory um, kind of evaluation process. And I think there are some um, important moves being made to review some of those um, metrics and, and some of those ways that we evaluate colleagues' contributions. Um, certainly in the Department of War Studies, over the last few years, we um, have seen a much more uh, serious embrace of issues surrounding EDI in general. Uh, so that encompasses uh, questions around women and, and gender, but also uh, around, um, around ethnicity, around uh, the gaming attainment gap, around uh, LGBTQ A plus visibility, uh, around neurodiversity and a whole bunch of other really important issues. Um, we do have, um, we've had, we've, we've made some appointments um, 
at the school levels, so that's between security studies and war studies, focusing specifically on, on EDI. Uh, and we have some fabulous colleagues working um, and, and, and people's time actually being ring fenced officially rather than people having to work on these things, um, you know, in addition to their formal workloads. So that's really important. Um, we do still have some issues, as I said earlier, surrounding um, intersectional questions. So whilst there has been some improvements in terms of gender, we are still lagging behind when it comes to uh, representation uh, with, with colleagues of colour and women of colour in particular. So, so that, that's the, the drum that I'm, I'm banging <laughs> and others in the department are. Um, we need to address our hiring practices, how jobs are advertised, how research areas are, are, are centred in the department in order to, to attract people um, from, from across a diverse range of backgrounds, which is what students want, it's what colleagues want, it's what's good for the institution. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can uh, make some changes in that direction. Okay, well, um, I haven't been at King's long enough to really be able to say anything definitive about the department. Um, so I don't know that I can talk about what's changed in the past five years. Um, prior to King's, I was at LSE, it's where I did my PhD and I did a year of a postdoc there. And I mean, I know there, um, the student bodies were quite diverse, quite um, really, really great mix of, of people, um, both at the PhD level, undergrad as well. Uh, but the faculty was not, women were, were certainly missing, um, definitely at the higher levels. I didn't see that change over the time that I was there, not in a, not in a really convincing or meaningful way, at least. Um, and I, I know it's a known problem, but um, it, it doesn't in, inspire much confidence <laughs> uh, to see that these changes are so slow and you can spend, you know, uh, half a decade at a place and not really notice any changes in that way. What I have noticed, though, is that, um, and this might stretch back a little more going back to my MA, um, and I was in a different country, so the comparison maybe isn't so great, but um, around mentorship, I find that there are many more female mentors around now that I, I can I look to um, whereas before there was a pattern of many of my mentors were, were male and I don't know if that's just the, um, the field of study my interests and how they've changed or maybe it's a um, sign of something uh, a bit a bit different a bit uh, positive um, but otherwise yeah I, I think that's what I'd say around the past five years and then looking forward um, to, to, to sort of think about what I predict would happen I'm not sure, obviously, but um, I think one thing that I'm noticing is that we are able to be a bit more vulnerable and to talk more about our, vulnerabil our vulnerabilities. Sorry, <clears throat> um, not, not just, you know, we don't have to keep it away from our workplace as much as we used to. So there are a lot of candid conversations, more so than ever, around um, our needs, our sensitivities, uh, um, disabilities and whatnot, and that these are going to be our strengths, that they are our strengths, but that even more so, I feel like we're moving in the direction where um, being vulnerable is, a, is actually a, a huge strong point. Um, I think through COVID, especially, the conversation has changed. I, I have much more personal conversations with colleagues than ever before, I think because we're experiencing, we're experiencing something that's so fundamentally personal and, and, and deep and profound and difficult. And um, I think I see, yeah, I see great prospects for that. So hopefully conversations around mental health um, in academia will, will turn into not sort of sideline conversations, but will be part of really are talking about it will be part of our job and and we will address those more forcefully and we'll take care of ourselves and each other better um i'll just jump in um i mean i've been at king's for a long time now and and i think i've only consciously started to think about this through my phd which is the past sort of four or five years um what is interesting is I have seen a lot more women being part of the community at the junior level. Um, so, for example, at the Defence Studies Department, which is notoriously you go and teach the military there, and it's it's unapproach it's the reputation is quite un unapproachable. Um, there were all of us who were hired as graduate teaching assistants last year were all women, um, and one thing that I would could point to that has really affected that change is 
the presence of stronger women higher up the ladder, Aggie, you're always one of them, um, who are willing to question, who are willing to um, call things out, who are willing to sort of look at all of us who are more junior and say, you know what, it's okay to question things. It's okay to say, this is not on. Um, and I think that space that they have created has, has led a lot of women to feel like they're welcome here as they are, um, that you know they, they can ask questions they have. They can also be new and be junior and as you said, Karan, be vulnerable and have other things going on in their lives um, and still be 100% there and excellent academics and, and that there's no, that's not sort of mutually exclusive. Um, and, and so I've, I've seen a lot of women there in, in the sort of junior and, and middle level positions come in, which, which I think has changed the culture a bit more um, and the conversations about EDNI, as Aggie said, what I do think is the problem though, and, and that's the problem with academia and probably other professions um, that I can't speak for, is the retention of women uh, and who can actually make it up to the top, to professorial level. And, and you can see that it taper um, quite quickly. And not knowing much about it, being fairly new to this, what I can definitely say is the one thing that has made me stick through my PhD, which was ridiculously hard at times and and sort of through academia and the constant pressure of work and having to prove yourselves is these sort of networks of female solidarity um where we were all together in this facing the same problems and you are not alone and, and any question you asked you found someone else there who was willing to say well actually i faced that too and, and you're not alone doing it so i think in the next five or ten years it's not just about the entry of women into academia, but I think how um, I think fe these female networks and, and colleagues act as gatekeepers or, or sort of as guardrails for not only for women to keep continue loving academia as a profession and continue going on and, and sort of um, rise up the ranks, but also sort of for newer women to enter the profession and, and possibly a friendlier profession um, is going to be really important. But um, yeah, so that's why, and also Aggie, thank you for being you. I don't know if I've said this to you before, but thank you. Thank you all for really, really great answers. I think you've all touched upon things that we can all resonate with and that are so important, ranging from intersectionality, diversity to mental health. And as you say, uh, Savani, the retention of female academics, which is a completely sort of separate component of the acquisition of female academics that, that the sort of focus of the debate often seems to often seems to lie on. So that was that was it for, for my prompted question. So we're going to go in to uh, your questions now, the participants question. There's been a little bit of a sneaky Q&A going on in the chat already, so I'm going to extract some of that. We've got a question from uh, Bob Adams about PhDs. And this is very interesting because I don't know about the rest of the participants here, but coming from Norway, where PhDs are very, very rare, it's really interesting to see kind of the culture in, in the UK and in Germany where everyone seems to have one or a lot of people seem to have one. So this is a really cool question because Bob Adams asks, I are in pub public policy are fields where a PhD can have a career merit outside of academia, whether in government or private practice. As professional academics, what are your opinions on the use of PhDs outside academia? I'll, I'll assume we're going in the same order and I'll jump yeah. in. I did um, reply to Bob separately just in the chat um, and we had a little bit of a, a back and forth about that. I mean, my sense is that a PhD is certainly useful um, outside of academia. If you want to go into international organisations or institutions, the UN and these kinds of things. Uh, also, if you want to go into the third sector, um, if you're interested in journalism and consulting, think tank uh, research and these sorts of things, it does give you this sense of sort of epistemic authority and, and it gives you this, this sense of, of being a real specialist in your field. So that oftentimes will allow you to go for more senior posts um, and, and to stand out uh, among other candidates for posts uh, who may have undergrad or, or master's level um, qualifications. I mean, it's, it's a funny one when we're asked about this question, you know, I, I would always encourage people to do a PhD because it's, you know, it's the most 
challenging thing you'll probably ever do. Oftentimes one of the most gratifying as well. Um, but it's also the case that the job market is a bit of a, a, bit of a nightmare. Um, that was true 10 years ago when I finished. Uh, people were saying, gosh, you know, I don't know how, you know, your generation is going to manage, you know, it had really changed from a, a, a landscape in which you could either be an excellent teacher or an excellent researcher to having to be both plus uh, extra administrative roles, plus being a manager and, and all of these sorts of things. Um, and the situation has really only got more competitive over time. Um, so for people coming out at, at Avni's um, period very recently, you know, you would be in the minority to have got a, a position so, so quickly. The other big problem we have, of course, is um, precarity. That we have increasing number of people uh, employed on temporary contracts. Um, you know, some of us have, have had temporary have had temporary contracts and then permanent. And then, if you want to move, you have to go back to precarity. In that sense, you know, sometimes for five or ten years of living with a, an uncertainty about whether you'll have a job <laughs> following the end of your contract, that can be extremely difficult to manage as well. So, I would always say to people, you know, go into academia with your eyes open. That if, if job security is something you want before you're in your mid thirties it's unlikely you'll find it here uh, so that there are risks and also that has effects for people who are planning families and other sorts of things that those things often get delayed um, or can slow things down if you try and do them simultaneously so it's, it's really worth thinking about how you want to balance those things and, and what kinds of things you can do to insulate yourself from those potential difficulties not entirely related to Bob's question but, but hopefully um, pertinent nevertheless uh, I'll, I'll shut up now. Thanks. Just to say also, um, thank you for the shout outs, Avni. I feel completely <laughs> un, uh, unworthy of that. All the EDI work has been extremely collaborative. Um, it's also funny to hear myself thought of as someone senior. Um, I only just made senior lecturer, although I am uh, more, more advanced career wise. But it did, just last thing, it did lead me to reflect on something, um, which is that, well, two things. First of all, don't leave until you're more senior, something that you can do now. You know, you do have more power and epistemic authority than you might think. As a student, you have all sorts of powers, partly because you're treated as a, a consumer, but also partly because, you know, you are the center of a lot of what, what we do. Um, but even as a junior colleague, as a PhD student, you know, you, you do have the capacity to, to have the conversations and to, to bring up um, problems as they arise. Um, you know, thinking about how to do it and with whom to do it is important. Um, but you don't have to be a professor in order to have an opinion, uh, in, order to, in order to make change in an institution. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Aggie. Would would any of the other two want to want to jump in on this question as well? Um, Karen, go for it. No, I was just going to say I don't have much more to add. I thought that was great. Yeah, I think yeah, that was really great. I mean, the only thing I would add is. Um, there were times during my PhD when I thought I was done with academia, as everyone who's done a PhD will a hundred percent agree. Um, and, and that was the point I was looking at different jobs um, outside of academia and things I could do. Um, at the end of it, I realized I didn't like anything else as much as I love this. So I, I was just speaking to my husband the other day and I said, well, you know, even if I'd, I've had the worst week and I just want to curl up, I look back and I think, oh, I actually really love that. Um, and, and there's very few, um, times you can have that and, and those highs and those lows um, and that's something and, and it's almost like an adrenaline adrenaline rush um, when you you get there and, and you sort of feel that um, but in terms of skills I think with the PhD there's always a lot of more fundamental things and fundamental skills that you build through the process I think tenacity and um, and and some sort of work ethic it's it's a you know, no PhD student has a nine to five work ethic, but um, the fact that we get things done and, and keep doing it for four years, I think gives you skills that you, you don't really, you can't really comprehend in that moment. Um, and, and I think those skills are very, very important in a lot of jobs where sometimes, you know, you may not find, you may not have results that day or that month, uh, but with a PhD, you don't have the results for four years and you still keep going. Um, so I think, if you are trying to look for a job outside of academia, I think it's worth highlighting those skills really that, that you can't really learn from you know, a degree or, or a training course. But that's, I think that's all I have to say. 
Thank you. That's that's very interesting. And tenacity sure seems to be the key word here. I saw Sarah doing a, a bit of a sigh there when you mentioned how hard it is to, to keep going without any tangible results for that amount of time. So thank you for your responses. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Camilla, which uh, is addressed to Dr. Hurst, but I think I'll ask it to everyone. And that is, uh, as far as you know, at least, how have people reacted to bringing up the issues relating to uh, relating to the lack of diversity in the department? Are people reacting defensively or by taking the issue seriously? Do you think it matters who brings it up? This is quite interesting because WeMoop has also been involved in the efforts uh, to, to voice these issues. So it'd be great to hear your perspectives on that as well. I mean, it's, it's a great question, Camilla, and it's one that I think will bring a wry smile to the faces of everybody uh, involved. Uh, Sadney and Kieran and many others on the call are also involved in the EDI activities. Um, I would say it's a, it's a mixed bag. Um, the, uh, so, as I've said, we had a change in leadership in the department a couple of years ago, um, and they are, are much, much more well disposed towards um, having these conversations than uh, previous leaderships uh, in various ways uh, have, have been. Um, so our current head of department, our current deputy head of department is making a really concerted effort to sort of mainline, mainstream EDI. So they've recently invited us to, to uh, report at every departmental meeting. Uh, we have bespoke EDI sessions now with the senior leadership team. We set up these five working groups that have a combination of staff and students involved. We've secured an EDI budget of £5,000 a year, which has allowed us to pay student ambassadors and facilitators for, uh, for work of various kinds. Um, we're currently putting together a survey to uh, kind of try and take the temperature of the department and feed into um, a kind of transforming the curriculum handbook that we're also putting together. Um, and this is something that, that, the, that the senior leadership team is, is, is supporting and is uh, behind. Um, that said, it doesn't mean that every conversation is easy and it doesn't mean that um, there hasn't been pushback. Um, you know, you have to make sure that you're engaging people in, in, in processes. You can't go in and just kind of change your department because you feel like it. You've got to consult and engage. Um, and those conversations um, aren't always simple and they don't always lead to the outcome that you might like. Um, but it's a collective enterprise. Um, it's interesting, Safni's point about kind of, you know, feeling, feeling kind of evaluating how you feel at, at the end of the day. And I would say that, you know, 95% of the time, you know, one, one kind of feels like it's really been brilliant and worth it and five percent of the time you feel really cheesed off and like you haven't been able to get your point across or you haven't been able to convince somebody who was feeling um reticent about something um there are some folks in the department who are actively hostile to some of these uh, enterprises um certainly decolonizing the curriculum is a, a bit of a divisive issue um some people are extremely well disposed to the idea of you know bringing in voices from the global south and and um and, and being colleagues and so on um, others feel like it's political correctness gone mad and that we ought to leave the curriculum as it is and that uh, we ought not to be uh, putting pressure on each other to, to change things. Um, you know, really, it's, it's been such a collaborative effort that I think what we've done is actually build up a certain kind of momentum, which has made it much more difficult for those detractors to, um, to not engage with impunity. So, for instance, we now have EDI representation in the education committee when people submit new modules you know we say if it's a completely white male reading list we send it back and say you know you have to reflect on this you know this matters it matters for attainment it matters for students belonging and well-being um, and I think it's it's starting to, to think in um, it certainly I think matters who brings it up um, and it's not I mean not you know as I say I'm relatively junior I only got made permanent a couple of years ago I uh, only just got my promotion this year. So, you know, oftentimes it has been me, you know, temporary junior lecturer trying to have conversations with professors who've been in the department for, for 20 years. Um, and that's not always comfortable. But then you have students coming to talk to you about their experience and you, you just know that the conversation has to be had. So, you know, um, as the committee, we do work individually, we do work um, and, and, you know, you, you, you push where it's pushable and you try to maneuver in an effective way and communicate clearly and, and have people engage. Uh, and hopefully the message will, will proliferate. I can come in too on that, um, just to share a little bit about not what I've experienced at King's, but uh, what I've experienced at my past institution, which is that um, re the reaction to, you know, sort of bringing up these issues uh, related to lack of diversity have usually been met well as in the talk is good the there's 
there's talk, it's happening, people agree, they want to make a change, they see the point, they see the purpose, but then there's a block after that. So the conversations all seem good, but then there's an unwillingness at the institutional level to change processes. And what I find is that um, people who are sitting in a place of, you know, the power to change things kind of, they'll, they'll just say, well, the bureaucracy, you know, we can't, we can't really do it. It would be too much to change. And it's the bureaucracy and the institutional processes that sort of kill the will uh, to make things happen. And I think that can be very um, discouraging and very, um, uh, yeah, discouraging <laughs> because uh, there's, the, you, you are in rooms sometimes where there's so much solidarity and you feel like you're moving forward and then really I think there's a complacency sometimes or a, I just don't want to step on toes um, and there's very little you can do about it as a, as a very junior person or as a PhD student sometimes. Um, so that's, that's something that I've noticed and it's something that I don't yet have much understanding of how to overcome. Um, but I do think it matters who who brings things up and I have seen um, how far it goes when students themselves voice what they're feeling and uh, what they're experiencing. I think the student voice goes a long way um, and it, it, it shouldn't. Yeah, it, I think it's something that I've always noticed and I feel quite strongly about. Um, just to quickly add to that, Kiran, I think I think a small measure of hope. I I take a small measure of hope from the fact that you know, in two thousand ten, when I was a student, um, the the curriculum I learned represented very little of what I grew up with and and my sort of inherent knowledge. Uh, but I don't think there was a sense of empowerment within the student community to ask those questions. And then fast forward to now, um, and you see the wonderful student at King's sort of, they're part of the EDI committee, they, they ask these questions, they make sure, you know, that the institution hears their voices. And I think that sense of empowerment in my experience in academia is, is a giant step forward. Uh, but um, I completely agree with Kiran, it's, it's it can be quite discouraging and, and yeah, but I think that's, that's really something that's stuck with me through the, the low bits. Thank you all so much for really, really good and comprehensive answers to that question. I think it's only gonna, we're only gonna see it grow in importance going forward. So it's really, really cool to know that we have some great allies here in the room. So just uh, jumping a bit uh, thematically to one of the most recent questions that we got, which is about uh, mentorship. So we have Srinivas, hope I pronounced your name right. Thank you for shining a light on the path that you took to reach wherever you are today. Uh, and her question is for the mentors in all of you because she is an international student pursuing a PhD in the US. And she says, I always struggle when I try and mentor or positively influence others who are today where I was when I was 18 and may want to do what I did. Are there some ways in which you all help someone take their first few steps in their career? because she worries that she comes across as imposing or as someone who knows better. And I would like to pop on a follow-up question um, to her question, which is, because Kieran, you also mentioned mentorship in your, in your introductory talk. And are there any mentorship opportunities that you know of for current students or graduates uh, that they could seek out? So both, what is it like to be a mentor, but also do you know of any opportunities for, for the participants here that they could uh, explore? Um, I think um, maybe some other folks on the call can can elaborate. I think there was a PhD student mentoring scheme that was mooted at the EDI committee um, over the last year. And I think that's actually begun now in earnest, right? Um, that, that people more advanced in their PhDs um, are, are kind of helping induct and support people in the earlier stages there. Um, I don't know if, if Savni or Kieran, you know any more about that? No. <laughs> Um, there's the, the, so the PGR mentoring scheme. Um, anyone at King's contact Miranda. Um, if Miranda is in the audience, can you? Um, she can pop the, her email if she wants. Um, but the PGR mentoring scheme is excellent, and I think it, it is peer mentoring, but also um, more structured. So senior PhD students mentor junior, and, and it's excellent. Um, just in terms of mentoring, though. Um, I've had some thankfully wonderful, wonderful mentors. Um, I don't know if it's accidental or, or a conscious choice of almost always been women. Um, and not to st stay too on theme here, but, um, and, and it, 
it on one hand it speaks to Aggie's point about female colleagues being asked to take on a more pastoral role or being expected to because you know when you're 18 and you want to mentor and you find a female mentor it's great but then when you're an academic being a mentor to all of these students it, it can get quite draining um, but I think when you try and mentor to answer your question I think I think listening active listening is is what I try and practice um, I think it helps that I have a lot of younger siblings so it's sort of been cultivated into me by force of habit uh, but um, just to sort of keep in mind that we can draw from our own experiences but our solutions may not work and sometimes it's not even about finding solutions it's sometimes mentoring is about providing a space for people to be able to be vulnerable to be able to ask questions that they fear are stupid um and and i i think i'm not sure i'm a mentor to a great many people at all uh but whoever whenever someone tries to ask me questions i try and keep that in mind if that helps yeah just to, to jump in again on that i, I I think mentorship comes in in many forms. I think there are senior colleagues who have been official mentors of mine who actually haven't been very helpful. Not at, not I would say at King's. Uh, certainly in my in my previous post, um, mentorship felt a little bit like being kind of evaluated and um, and and being ticked off by a sort of disappointed uncle or something, which wasn't that much fun. Um, but on the flip side, um, there are probably many people out there who have mentored me that haven't actually even known that they've done it. Um, senior colleagues who have just been really uh, engaged, who have you know written a reference for a job, who have consoled me when something's gone wrong, who've um, you know I, I hear the echoes of, um, of of some of my kind of most esteemed senior colleagues um, in my head now and again, just you know throwaway comments that they said that have kind of stayed with me. Uh, one of which is about um, following your nose. That actually academia is a bit like it's a bit like being a dog. You just have to kind of keep sniffing out those things that are of of interest, and and many other examples besides. Um, I think oftentimes one doesn't know when one is mentoring somebody else. Um, when you're writing you know, promotion applications, these kinds of questions come up. Um, and it took me a little while to think about, you know, actually when I've had you know, a team of, of, of four or six GTAs for a module, you know, I've, I've had marking kind of, uh, sort of training sessions with them. And I've, I've advised people on you know, how to write job applications. And I've looked over people's PhD proposals and all these kinds of things. So I think, you know, I think just you know being a being a good colleague um, is um, is about sort of doing mentoring um, without the label, um, and also also just yeah just acting um, acting in those ways really to, to support people. I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, I can come in and say a little bit. I am um, I consider mentoring. Well, when I teach, I feel like I'm also mentoring at the same time. And when students get in touch, I feel like that's mentoring. I take mentoring to mean something quite broad and I love it. I love talking to people on a more personal level than just me in front of a class or in front of a group. Um, I also I, I also have younger siblings. I have a brother who's 15 years younger than me and I more or less raised him. And I kind of have always been comfortable with that role of sort of you know giving advice but also um hearing the excitement and for what people want to do and I, I really like that process i think that um i i can understand the the feeling of you know you feel like you might be imposing and and i know that i love mentoring because i wish i'd had more advice when i was 18 or 19 or in my 20s or even two years ago i know that's why i do it um but at the same time i I love that everybody has their own path. Everybody is their own person. They're going to do, they're going to do things that they, you know, can't foresee yet. And so mentoring doesn't have to be sort of, you know, follow this path, do these things. If you do X, Y, Z, you'll make it to whatever career you want to do, or you'll get into the program. I don't think advice is like that is necessarily always helpful um, because so much is known. Mentoring is more about, uh, like, like Savani said, like listening, um, so you know solidarity uh, and 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 just collaborating collaboration of thought and and feeding each other's minds i think it's a kind of a bit of a two-way process as well i learn a lot from people i talk to thank you so much all three of you it sounds it sounds very familiar <laughs> for better or for worse the the dynamics of mentorships and it's very true that 
some of the best mentoring can just be very, very indirect and almost like general advice. I know that something that stuck with me and my peers who did international conflict studies last year was something that our esteemed professor Vivienne Jabbery said in the first lecture, uh, possibly the most articulate person on the planet, but she said something very, very simple, which is so true. And that was just simply, don't be shy. It's a waste of life. And that was something nice, simple, easy to remember. <laughs> so thank you guys. There's still so many good questions coming in, but I think we're going to have to round off with a last one here. And I'm going to pick um, one from Kira, who says that she uh, appreciates the acknowledgement of structural issues driving imposter syndrome a lot. And her question is related to that. And that is, how do you navigate professional and or academic spaces that are at times actively hostile to you? Where do you find the strength to keep going? I think we can apply this to, to a general sort of career sense almost. Um, do you think exhaustion of resisting hostility from peers and seniors to institutions themselves play a role in the level of retention of mar marginalized groups in academia? But certainly, certainly feel free to, to be personal on this one if you like. It's a great questions, Kira, and I think you, you draw attention to some really um, vital points there. Um, the simple answer to the last part, I think, is absolutely yes. Um, one of my brilliant colleagues, um, Dr. Leonie Anza, Mr. Fries, is currently um, writing a, a research project looking at exhaustion, um, particularly when it comes to migration and how exhaustion is actually used as a kind of tool of governance. Um, and actually, you know, you, you do see um, people and you, you do see um, colleagues um, you know, experiencing the sharp end of, of some of that. Um, and I, you know, I, I think that when, whether it comes to student retention uh, or, or colleague staff retention, um, the, the everyday experience of an institution really matters. Um, and if you are implicitly or explicitly treated in a hostile manner, that is going to take its toll. It's going to alienate, it's going to disengage, it's going to, to drive people away ultimately. Um, on how you find the strength to keep going, um, I think it's about, um, it's about two things. It's first of all about remembering why you're doing it. I think if you ever find yourself as an academic doing it for instrumental reasons or for its own sake, then you kind of miss the point. Um, I think it, you keep going because it, there are things that are at stake that are worth keeping going for. Um, you get that energy from students who are full of great ideas and great indignations and full of, of drive and energy. And, and so you, you're feeling, you know, I always even though I'm exhausted by the end of a teaching day, I'm also extremely animated and, and kind of ignited by all of this sort of dynamism. So that's one resource. Uh, another resource is um, the peer group that I, um, that I mentioned, you know, whether it's the EDI committee, as we've been discussing, or, or my other friendships or, or connections, you know, I, I would not, if, if it were me trying to, to have any of these conversations, I'd have, you know, thrown in the towel long ago. Um, but you know, when things go well for other people, when they go badly for other people, when you're part of this dynamic of people getting disciplined and rewarded and, and these fair and unfair things happening, it makes you feel like you're part of a, a group, part of a movement, whether it's decolonizing work, whether it's you know, trying to sort of engage uh, you know, students from a certain part of the world or with a certain background who feel alienated. So I think in a sense, the, the, the persistence of the problem um, is it kind of creates the persistence of the energy to do something about it. That said, one thing we haven't yet talked about is, um, we talked about you know, getting into to academia and our, our backgrounds there, but having been in academia 10 years now uh, as, a, as a lecturer, uh, and indeed a PhD student before that, I can attest that it is definitely not a kind of um, smooth enterprise. There have been periods that have been extremely positive in my career, and my time at King's uh, has, has been a, a real kind of uh, up. Um, but at other points in my career, I was extremely close to, to leaving. Um, I would say, you know, mental health stuff was not fabulous at all times. Um, and I think what my experience, if I could leave you with one message today, it's that um, trying to, to not couple too tightly your sense of value as a human with how well your academic career is going. Um, and that's something that's really hard to do when you're hugely invested um, and take a lot of, of your kind of um, subjective worth from, from your, your academic enterprises. Um, and that involves retaining connections outside of academia, having, having real world friendships and real, real life um, activities. Uh, I think that's all extremely important. Um, there was something else I wanted to say, but I feel like I've talked for too long, so I'll, I'll shut up. Um, but thanks very much. Um, I think that's such a great question. And I 
I would, I loved what Aggie said. I'd be absolutely lying if I <laughs> said I had an answer about how to navigate all of that because I don't and I'm still learning and I find it quite hard at times. Um, but I think um, Aggie, that advice that, uh, you know, not tying your self-worth to your work, <laughs> to your job, um, to this to this industry is so important. It's something that I'm, yeah, I, I haven't managed to perfect doing that yet. I find um, academia can be very, very high pressure sometimes. And after doing a PhD, this is one thing about the PhD is that there's no, it, it's hard to, I mean, some people do it really well where they're able to kind of separate PhD and, and life. But I find that working on something like that on your own over a long period of time, it becomes so all encompassing that you, you kind of are in the practice of always thinking that your work is, is you and it takes a while to get out of that. Uh, so I'm certainly not there yet. Um, but I think the advice to remember why you're doing what you're doing is important and to follow your gut. And you, you will be, you know, you will be met at times with um, hostility or, um, or just people saying no, that's, that's fairly normal. Um, although it can be discouraging and it can be harmful too. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I've been told no a lot in my life, but I think I've learned over the course of it that actually nothing, at least in my case, nothing really bad has happened from someone saying no and then you pushing ahead and ignoring and moving on anyways. In fact, the, the keep on going, you find actually good things come of it and you learn about yourself a lot more um, and you learn uh, to, to kind of not listen to the, the noise, which there's a lot of it around. So yeah, just, just to say what Aggie said. <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to echo that, um, what Aggie said. Uh, but also I think with hostility, there's two kinds of hostility, especially in academia is, one is the sort of direct confrontation. So I remember my first instance, and, and you can never recover from it, is when in a conference, I was really proud of this paper I presented and, and it was, I'd spent ages doing it. And then someone who was older and, and um, anyway, they tore it apart, but they weren't even a subject expert in my subject, right? And, and I remember standing there and thinking, wait, what, what's happening? Uh, because I think when you get into your PhD, you, you realize, because it's such a solitary endeavor, you, you forget that, you know, because you're constantly questioning yourself, you think you're okay with criticism and you're okay with critique because you're doing that to yourself day in, day out, seven days a week. Right. And then I think that hostility of, of someone else critiquing your work when they actually don't really know much. And, and I think this is a fairly consistent practice in academia. When I talk to other colleagues, I found especially sort of more younger junior colleagues. Um, and I think I'm working on on that a lot more uh, because I think that affects the confidence with which you can access spaces that you think are close to you, which may not be. Um, and I think, and I completely agree with Kiran's point about deconflicting yourself from your work. And, and it's hard because you never stop working. You're constantly, there's, there's another thing going on and you're constantly thinking. And, and what really, really is important is thinking, well, tomorrow, if I want to stop all of this, and this is what I say to myself, if in five years I start disliking any part of this, I'm going to stop. Um, and, and while that may not be true, I mean, I, I don't think I will be able to do that, but I would like to work to get myself to a point where I can say, I don't need academia to define my life. Um, and, and because I think, because it's your name on every publication, on every course you teach, it's harder to separate yourself and your identity from your work. But, but I think if, if something that has helped me do this is constantly telling myself, I don't need to keep doing this if I don't like it. Um, and, and I'm not reduced to a publication or a lecture um, and, and having real world friendships. And, and I think for every piece of hostility you face, and at least I faced, I think I'll just end at this. There is four more people who are there sort of waiting to say, you know what, I've faced that and, and it's fine and, and we're going to fight this. Um, and, and that's what actually sort of kept me afloat. So if you find good friends, hold on to them. Um, and, and friendships in academia can be incredibly strong. It's, it's sort of a bit like going to war, but not really together. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for that great summary and the great advice that you all give when you say, I'll oh, hold on to friendships in academia. Sarah and I are looking at, <laughs> looking at each other like it's so true. Find your friends at Kings and stick with them. So thank you so much again. I'll just round off uh, for my part by uh, just highlighting an event that I popped in the chat because you've all uh, touched upon so many things about self-coaching and self-motivation, but also sort of just general career advice that I think we can all really relate to. And we with is hosting a workshop with Rachel Stocky, who's the head of entrepreneurial skills at King's next week on March 23rd. And Rachel is amazing. It's gonna be the first, uh, the third workshop in a series of three that we conducted with Rachel. And personally, I learned so much from them. So everyone who's here is very welcome to join uh, that workshop. And uh, thank you so much on my part. I'll hand over to Sarah for the, the closing remarks. Thank you, Kristen. Yes, um, we did have Rachel for three workshops and she actually, the first one she did was imposter syndrome, which has come up quite a bit tonight. She's going to be recording a video. We didn't record that session because it got quite personal, um, but she's going to be recording quite a general video on how to deal with imposter syndrome as a woman in academia. And once that is over to us, we'll put it up on our website, which is in the chat there. So do look out for that if it's of interest. I completely echo what Kristen said. Thank you so much. Uh, Aggie, Kieran and Savni. I have been sat here the whole way through this event, especially after the events of last weekend, um, just feeling really comforted to have access to a network and to uh, experts like you who can be candid about the challenges that we face. Um, and like Kieran was saying about the strength in vulnerability, um, it's very, very encouraging and we're very grateful that you made the time to uh, come and speak with us this evening. So thank you. Uh, I have one final tiny question that I love to end all of our events with. Um, if you were to bump into yourself at the start of your career journey in a, in a corridor and you had 30 seconds to give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? <clears throat> I mean, I think two things. First of all, and it, it builds on something we were talking about um, previously, it's really actually taken me until really about the last kind of year or so to identify a way of working which is sustainable, by which I mean not existing in kind of either kind of hyperactive frenzies of, of writing kind of uh, mania or complete research inactivity and, you know, alienation and, and depression. So I think, first of all, think of try to get away from the idea that to be good at this, you have to be in a kind of mad wired mindset. You know, good academic work happens at pace, at a measured pace over time. And, you know, you don't have to be some kind of romantic, dramatic kind of caricature in order to be doing this right. Um, second of all, um, it goes back to this question about, um, about having people with whom to check in about whether or not what's being asked of you is reasonable and thinking about um, loyalty, I think. So oftentimes when you're a junior academic, you're so thrilled to have got your first position that you just give 110, 150, 100 million percent. Um, and it's really important, I think, to bear in mind that, that some institutions are guilty of overworking young academics um, and to make sure that you don't confuse loyalty to your colleagues and students with loyalty to an institution. As Avni very wisely says, if something isn't working, you can leave. You know, we all hear a lot about toxic relationships and, and you know when it is the right time to step away um, and you can leave your existing department you can leave your field you can leave academia altogether um, make sure that you do what you need to do for yourself if something isn't working for you um, and, and and prioritize that you know, don't don't end up being devoured by something which um, which can happen um, I'll leave it there thanks and so I think if I could go back and tell myself anything I'd take myself by the shoulders, look at myself in the eyes, and I'd be, I'd say, everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> I think that's the thing I would tell myself, everything's gonna be fine. I think um, uncertainty and insecurity and job precarity, those things have huge effects on us and uh, it's very hard to live with insecurities. Um, but I have found like through this pandemic and through uh, uncertainty still that well, we live today, that, uh, that I, you know, face, now I find if I tell myself it's gonna be fine, I can kind of focus a bit more and just be a bit more present. I think I've, I think 
yeah, I just think everything's going to be okay. You don't need to plan. You don't need to have a stellar plan. Things will go up, things will go down, things will not go according to how you expect, but there's sort of beauty in that. And I think through my roundabout journey through working in different places, different industries, ones with problems as well, I've learned a lot. And uh, those lessons, you know, you learn some really good lessons from adversity. So uh, you, yeah, you, you can't, um, you can't kind of shy away from from that at all but yeah everything's gonna be okay um if if i saw myself 10 years ago and i i would say i think first of all i'd say you're doing more right than you think you are um secondly just you're not alone and third you can't see the big picture from where you're standing um i think we get so overwhelmed um because we're constantly under pressure to do the right thing um, that it's it's hard to take stock of things and, and you know to to really look at things in perspective and I think I one thing I would give my younger self is just a healthy sense of this is not the whole picture and and have some perspective um, and I think I've learned that over the years and and knowing that there are people you can call on it's not it's not a problem. You can, you can just pick up the phone and call someone and say, I've had a shit day. Um, and, and that's all that matters. And, you know, and, and I think in the sort of uncertainty that Kieran's talking about and the current situation, especially, uh, we talk about Zoom fatigue, but honestly, um, I don't know if I'm in the minority here, but just sometimes a meeting you think is going to be incredibly boring and then just another one just makes you think, actually, all of these people think like me and all of these people are with me and I'm part of a community and that just sort of keeps you going for another year another month another day so yeah that's what I'd say thank you all and um, that's that's stellar advice and speaking of community um and some of those messages there you're not alone you're doing okay you're gonna be okay that's all uh they're all things that we whip exists to say so we are saying them to one another constantly and we're working very hard to say them to everybody else via our website and our events and that's why we're just so thrilled to have the support and engagement of people like you so thank you very much i can say thank you a thousand times because i really mean it i'm sure everybody on the call means it um we're really really pleased that we could hear from you today and the recording will be up on the website i sometimes like to watch events back again because i can uh pick up different things a second time so if anyone wants to do that it will be up on the website um hopefully sometime this week that being said everyone have a lovely evening thanks for attending and hopefully we'll see you all again soon thanks thank you so much thank you thanks everybody Bye bye bye